Doctors of Reddit. Have you ever seen someone outside of work and thought wow, that person needs to go to the hospital now? What were the symptoms that made you think this? My boss was taking her daughter to visit her father, who works as an emergency nurse in another city. The daughter had been feeling unwell, but downplayed her symptoms to avoid cancelling the trip and insisted on coming with her mum to pick up the father from work rather than staying in the hotel to rest. The father finished his shift and comes out to meet them in the car park, and as soon as he saw the daughter, went straight back into emergency mode, whisking her into the hospital and barking orders for IV fluids etc. The daughter ended up having bacterial meningitis and was going into septic shock. It was pretty serious and she nearly died a few times but eventually pulled through. If she had waited back at the hotel she probably would have died. Meningitis is terrifying. Totally fine to dead in less than 3 days. And it often happens to young and healthy people. I was so glad when the vaccine for viral bacterial meningitis was developed so at least I only had to worry about one. I was puking bile during flu season and had a slightly raised right side. After about a gallon of bile I told my mom, who works in the year that I needed fluids. So she brought me in for an IV. Good thing we went, because I had a massive tumor on my liver. It was close to bursting because it had outgrown its blood supply. When it was removed it broke apart like a rotten piece of fruit. That began a 5 year sug of living in hospitals and eventually led to my transplant in 2009. Celebrated my 8th liverversary this past September. Yay happy endings. Another time I'd puked in the sink in the dark. Only made it to the sink, and was going to rinse it and go back to bed but something told me to turn the light on. Good thing I did as I'd had an esophageal varus burst and had puked up a lot of blood. That's how we found out I had varices. Jesus. My mother-in-law is a doctor. We were in Disney World of all places and having dinner when she got up from our table without a word and walked to the table across from us and started yelling to the waiter staff to call the paramedics. She literally diagnosed or recognized the signs of a heart attack happening to someone by watching them and even gave them the baby aspirin sublingual nitroglycerine tab meds, most likely to be aspirin, though possibly nitroglycerine, unlikely to have been gasoline, she carried in her purse in case that ever happened. Then she stayed with them till the paramedics came. It was surreal. I'm sure it's the kind of thing that would have been apparent even without her minutes later, but it was crazy to see her do that. I used to babysit this girl, and was really into photography at the time, so would always take pictures of her, with parents permission. After a year or so I noticed that in any picture with flash, where you would expect red eye, her left eye would be white instead of red. I mentioned it to her mom who mentioned it to the doctor and sure enough, she was something like 90% blind in one eye. She always passed her school eye tests by doing the other eye first and memorizing the chart. Clever girl. I'm not a doctor, but I used to be an EMT, at gas stations on two separate occasions. I ran into a stroke and a hypoglycemic stupor. The stroke was trying to get the cashier to call 9, 1, 1. The cashier didn't understand because of aphasia, her mouth couldn't make the words her brain was telling her to. The hypoglycemic stupor was similar. The dude had stumbled into a shelf and was trying to stand back up while also looking for food. Both cases were obvious to the trained eye, so all I did was tell the cashier to call 9, 1, 1, and what to say to them. Doctor here. Had a cousin message me on Facebook complaining of neck pain that was worsening, a massive headache and a fever. Told her to get to the ear immediately. She was diagnosed with meningitis and was hospitalized for two weeks. I had meningitis as a kid and apart from a giant haze of days and nights passing without meaning and being forced to drink fluids, the thing that sticks out in my memory is the neck pain. Holy crap, I will never ever forget that pain. Just accidentally putting my chin down ever so slightly was enough to make me see stars. Definitely not a doctor, but I was a forensic death investigator which really doesn't normally line me up to see living people very often unless they were co-workers. But I remember I was at a scene in a bad part of town, a suspected OD at a drug house. Of course a bunch of people were rubbernecking and one of them was a guy that was clearly a user. He had track marks and skin popping cellulitis, skin infections from IV drug use. But what was really shocking is that he had acrotic fingers. All the fingertips on one hand were dead and black but his pink and ring finger were black all the way up to the hand. 
I'm no doctor but I've seen these conditions before on people that showed up at the ME's office. After getting the scene under control I went and had a polite word with the gentleman and explained that he needed to seek medical attention promptly. I told him about the local county hospital that's low cost, doesn't require insurance and will treat him without judgement. He just nodded, said he'd think about it then asked when the house would be open again cause that's where he lived most of the time. My mind was just blown. Well. Be seeing you later. Doc here. Honestly, the most frequent thing I see in real life is untreated anxiety and depression. And the number of people who are eating too much or drinking too much or watching TV 6 hours a day instead of going to therapy or getting on a medication is really astounding. Now, I love eating crap food and drinking and watching TV. But a lot of people use these as coping mechanisms that we just kind of accept as normal in our society. If only therapy cost the same as gas station liquor and shared Wi-Fi. Happened to me as a baby. My uncle came by for a visit, who is a doctor, noticed I didn't look quite right and needed to go to the hospital immediately. As he correctly saw it, I had a pretty severe case of jaundice. Not a doctor but was waitressing once and a doctor came up to me from across the room and told me to go to a surgeon about the lump in my throat. Honestly wasn't even that noticeable. It's where an Adam's apple would be on a male. I told him I'd gone to my doctor who said it was benign and he insisted I go to a specialist regardless. But I did and it was stage 2 thyroid cancer. Not a doctor but my dad is and this is his story. As a background he has been practicing medicine for decades now in his 50s, and is also a lifelong mountaineer. He has been the expedition doctor on many mountain climbs and has even written an article on high altitude medicine that has been translated into a load of other languages. So he was up a mountain in France that had a cable car. I believe it was the Aiguille du Midi Altitude 12604.99 featuring or 3842 meters. He noticed a lady with all the symptoms of AMS, acute mountain sickness, where some people are unable to go above 810k featuring 2500m, without experiencing dizziness, shortness of breath and other such things that happen when the brain is not getting enough oxygen. The lady and he partner were in the queue to get down the mountain but it was a big queue and taking a while. So my dad ended up in an argument with the lift attendants trying to get the poor lady down to safe altitude. She got down fine and her and her partner waited around 4 hours for my dad to come down to buy him a meal as thanks if I recall correctly. She didn't need hospital but if she had stayed up there for much longer she really could've and ams can get really serious. Just one of his many stories. I've been trying to get him to write a book. You'd think lift attendants working on a mountain would have some idea of ams. Not a doctor, but my neighbor, who I hadn't really met before. Slipped on her porch and hit her head on a cinder block acting as a step. She went around to the neighbors at 11.30pm, asking to borrow a phone to call her husband, who had taken the kids to see a movie. No one would let her use their phone, so I did. She was slurring and having trouble keeping focused and kept looking like she was going to pass out. I kept insisting she go to the hospital and I'd drive her, but she kept telling me she was going to wait for her husband. Her roommate was with her, so I kept pressing them too, but no one wanted to make a fuss. She had a couple beers around 8pm, so to me that seemed like she'd probably not be that drunk so long later after just 3 beers. I waited with her until her husband came home, told what happened. And, again, insisted she go to the air. After consideration, they all decided to wait and see in the morning. I regret not just demanding her to get in my car and go. She went to the dock the next day, and there was apparently some bleeding in her head and she now has some likely permanent damage from it. Apparently she was lucky to still have been alive. I didn't know her at all. I should have just made her go. Not a doctor, but a good story. My dad has giant bulging eyes. It's just how he looks and we all have giant eyes in my family. On multiple occasions my dad has had people come up to him in public and ask him to see a doctor about his eyes. He has before, and he's fine. We're just a strange alien family. Nurse practitioner here. I was a timer at a club level swim meet and noticed a 15 stroke 16 year old teen who was about to race with an irregular shaped, multicolored lesion that was at least 1 centimeter in size. I tracked down her parents and expressed my concern and recommend she see their family doctor. 
They were from out of town so I never found out if they followed my advice. I'm still a med student but the scariest I saw was a young guy who suddenly collapsed during a running competition at my faculty. Luckily he was back quickly on his feet but sudden syncope in a young healthy athlete is a serious sign of cardiac pathology like arrhythmias or a genetic heart disease. The guy who collapsed was diagnosed with a dangerous arrhythmia, Wolf Parkinson White, and was lucky to survive. I collapsed at work and was diagnosed with WPW. Got an ablation right away and I'm perfectly healthy. Modern medicine is awesome. Not a doctor but recently witnessed a lad go over the bars of his bike. Stopped to help him. He was so stunned he didn't realize he dropped his phone till I handed it to him. I tried to get him to rest a while but he insisted on riding off. Luckily I spotted a police car and described the lad and his bike to them and said I didn't think he was fit to proceed. They went in search of him. I hope they found H and gave the necessary medical attention. I'm a nurse. I had a friend who had this headache. Like really intense. He had to cover his eyes with his hands because he couldn't deal with the light. When I asked him to move his chin towards his chest he couldn't do it. Then he started to feel like he needed to throw up. That's when I knew. Meningitis. I've always heard this as a danger sign from my parents whenever I feel bad. So now anytime I have a combination of sore neck, typically from yoga circus aerials, and get a cold I'm always petrified. Still better than not knowing. But it also incentivizes me to get massages whenever I have hard workouts to eliminate that as a potential confusion. Obligatory not a doctor but I work in mental health care. There's a phenomenon you often see in women having manic episodes that you'd call manic makeup. In the middle of the day they'd look out for a night out, and don't recognize this isn't a normal look. Normally when you see this people are already really ill and need care. I was in the local supermarket in the middle of the day when I see a woman who looked like she was fresh out of a Rocky Horror performance. Otherwise was acting absolutely fine for being at the supermarket but the makeup seemed like a dead giveaway. Didn't want to say something to her on the off chance I was about to majorly offend someone perfectly well but overzealous with her eyeliner and blush. Went into work two days later to find she was under a psychiatric hold in the facility I work in. That's really interesting. I don't work in any kind of healthcare but I've noticed it too. People tend to laugh at it, think Amanda Bynes. But it's a pretty clear sign that someone's not okay. Not a doctor, but when I met a friend's family for the first time a few years ago I was surprised because her brother looked like Andre the Giant, whose distinctive appearance was acromegaly, caused by excess growth hormone. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to rudely comment on his appearance. Found out this year that he's being treated for a pituitary cancer. It sounds like he'll be okay but I wish I'd been rude and said something earlier. Firstly the obligatory I'm not a doctor. I used to work as a math tutor primarily with kids in elementary school. I've had pretty serious OCD as long as I can remember. I was helping out an 8 year old one day and she started talking about how she counts her steps. I started asking her about things similar to my own symptoms. By the end of the lesson I had checked just about every box on the OCD checklist. After the lesson I had a talk with her mother and explained the situation and recommended she talk to her doctor. This was a surreal experience being a 19 year old who's anxious to start out with trying to explain to a mother of 3 that one of her had the same thing that I struggle with. I know the feeling I literally just heard someone talk about how they are so stressed and can't sleep and my instant thought was get to a freaking doctor my friend it sucks knowing that if they don't listen to you it just gets worse. Not a doctor but I am an optician who takes his job very serious and this is about a patient I sent to the hospital from my office. A patient who picked up her glasses the month before called complaining of very recent spout of seeing double and getting a headache from it. Had her come in that afternoon to check her out and she needed a somewhat surprising amount of prism in her glasses. But sometimes it's easy for doctors to overlook that component when they do the exam. I rushed her glasses so she could pick them up the next morning. When she picked them up she said it was a complete relief and left. Next day she called saying she started to feel the same thing again. The optometrist was out but I had her come in anyway because it seemed really weird and there were some big red flags popping up. So, 
I'm not authorized to do examinations or diagnose but I know enough that I could probably open a place across the border and do everything. We threw up a couple lenses and determined the change from a coupe days before had doubled. Called the doc to come in immediately to check it out. Doc noticed the same thing and we called immediately for an ambulance to take her to the hospital. Aggressive brain tumor next to the nerves for eye movement. They gave her a month to live but we caught it early enough that she lived for 5 more months. I've worked with some doctors on 3 different medical mission trips. One in Haiti and two in Guatemala. Seemingly every fourth or fifth person that walked in the door over the age of 40 had something wrong with them that would have sent them to the hospital immediately in the states. I took blood pressures and blood sugars on the Guatemala trips, and we would regularly see people with blood pressures of over 180 and or blood sugars of over 300. Even had some people with blood sugars of 500, 600 or higher. And yet they'd just be walking around like nothing was wrong. Half of these people should have been dead with measurements like that. This kind of stuff happens in Mexico too. I'm currently an intern at a public hospital on the third biggest city in Mexico and people just come with that and they sometimes even refuse treatment or argue with the staff because I can't be diabetic. You're wrong and you know nothing. Finally a thread for me. Not me, but my parents. And they are not doctors, but lawyers. But that's not important. When I was a toddler, I loved carrot juice. I drank it a lot and actually started to turn yellow. My parents noticed at some point and took me to the hospital immediately. The doctor looked at me and asked, why is your kid yellow? My parents didn't have anything other than actually. That's what we wanted to ask you to offer. But sure enough, when they stopped giving me carrot juice, I slowly looked normal again. I turned orange when I was a baby, too. Apparently I loved carrots and sweet potatoes. I'm just a medical student. But I recently saw someone on the bus who looked like a textbook case of advanced Cushing syndrome. Flushed and moon shaped face. Buffalo hump. Fatty tissue between shoulder blades. Hirsutism. Fresh stree. Thin skin. Central fat distribution with slim limbs. Doesn't sound that distinct, but the presentation jumps out at you with Cushing's patients. It's often caused by a pituitary adenoma, which is not uncommon and the patient is unaware it's even there. I didn't approach her because 1. I'm just a student. I could be very wrong. 2. Cushing syndrome is a common corticosteroid side effect. She could already be aware of it and it would be hurtful for me to point it out. I do wonder what happened to her. I was in Chicago and literally was forced to step over a homeless guy whose shin was broken and pointing at the wrong angle and the skin was very off color. I'm from a country with universal healthcare so my first thought was get to the freaking hospital. You should have called 911. They'd have treated him. All the time. As an a physician. Every time I walk to, say, Walmart, I'm very inclined to talk to people about their condition and seriousness of it, it doesn't have to be a very specific symptom but just by the way they walk, talk and stand up I can usually detect some common risks that are associated. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Walmart and similar stores are great places for health control centers. This is the most doctor sounding comment on here. I'm not sure if this counts because I while I wasn't at work but I was volunteering in a professional capacity at a youth tournament. It made for weekend of some concussions, a mild fracture or two, a few kids who needed stitches but mostly handing out ice packs, taping and calming down worried parents. I got called over to a distant field so one of the medics who was volunteering with me and I putted over in this cool vehicle that's like a big ATV with a truck bed that the ambulance service had modified to carry the equipment and could haul. Someone. Anyway, we get over expecting to find a bad bruise or something mild since the referee called us over with a walkie talkie and didn't sound serious. Nope. This kid is on the ground curled into a ball and was in so much pain he was past the point of screaming. If you've never been in that amount of pain count yourself lucky and if you have you know exactly what I mean. This kid can't tell us what happened but the coach and his dad said he has taken a stick to the left upper quadrant but that it wasn't that bad of a hit and the coach seemed to think the kid was exaggerating. Well we try to do the best exam we can but we're suspecting a cracked rib. But as we're starting the dad mentions that the kid has mono and wasn't cleared for contact yet but the coach, dad and kid all didn't think it would be a big deal if he played. For those of you who don't know, infectious mononucleosis has a nasty habit of causing swelling of the liver and the spleen. 
This sometimes can cause splenic rupturing. It can happen even without any trauma. Hence why sports and mono don't mix. Needless to say, taking a stick to the spleen is bad news bears. And suddenly the whole situation became a lot more serious. No one likes a ruptured spleen. Moral of the story, listen to your doctor when they tell you not to do something. Jesus. My co-worker died on the table several times and was resuscitated after a ruptured spleen. So they honestly thought he wasn't going to make it. He had mono and a doctor pushed too hard during an exam and... Yep, yeah, bad. Guy at the gas station coughing and sputtering, bringing up major mucus. Looked like he was about ready to pass out, but he was going to finish that cigarette. Given the gas and the cigarette I didn't stick around long. My mum's a dialysis nurse. When my nephew was born my brother was sending us pictures of him. My mum noticed that baby was looking jaundice so she told them they needed to head back to hospital. They promptly did. Jaundice in newborns is fairly common though. It isn't necessarily an abnormal finding, but should be followed up on. A relatively junior surgeon here. I have some very dodgy neighbors in my building and I am convinced the flat below me is dealing H through their letterbox to rough looking folk who hang outside their door. One morning I noticed a woman struggling up the steps to the flat clutching her groin. Working in one of the more deprived parts of the UK I have seen a lot of H addicts develop horrendous groin abscesses or false aneurysms. I've even seen a couple die from the resultant complications. This woman's pained gait and disheveled appearance was absolutely classic for this. She needed a CT angio and a vascular review at the very least. I didn't say anything to her. I really should have. Not me. But a few years ago, there was a doctor in my tennis group. We were playing doubles. And one guy, who historically has handled the physicality pretty well, seemed perpetually out of breath. Dr. Tennis player said it was very disconcerting and he should see someone ASAP. He did. Arteries were clogged and he underwent bypass surgery not long by after. Not a doctor and late to the party. But I do have a story of someone avoiding the hospital when they definitely, definitely shouldn't. Obviously this is a throwaway. Anyway story begins with this guy. Let's call him John. Who's in my grade. High school. I didn't really know him too well until after he came back from his junior year abroad, but now that he's back I've discovered we have a lot of mutual friends. Heard about this through one of them. John is a bit of a druggie. Drinks, smokes, probably some other stuff too. Not too uncommon in high school, but still not a great idea before you've graduated. However this pales in comparison to something he did about two weeks ago. John decided to get a tattoo. That's fine, I'd like one too someday. However, he decided to give it to himself using a tattoo gun he got from a friend in which he did not sterilize. Bad enough. But, John also decided to use this tattoo gun to write the word ego on his dong. Impressively, he succeeded. About a week later and a mutual friend tells me that John is now downing pain meds. I have no idea how he got them not prescription. At incredibly high volumes every day because he has gangrene. His dong has gangrene. This could mean he could lose his dong. And to my knowledge he still hasn't gone to the hospital. But I'm guessing you wanted physicians to answer this. But since that isn't what you typed. I saw a minor accident late one night. And drove up to offer assistance. Young man about 20 is behind the wheel and was swaying from side to side. I put my hand on his shoulder and asked him if he was okay checking for shock. In a loud voice. He was sweating profusely through his clothes. He had a thousand yard stare. He would not could not make eye contact with me. He was more or less unresponsive, though apparently semi-conscious. Face was flushed. I'm not that sort of doctor so I called the professionals for him. If I had to guess I'd say he was mixing alcohol with C. I don't believe he incurred any injury from the accident. Was probably more of an effect than a cause of his behavior. Cousin posted on Facebook about how her husband had been feeling sick and went to the chiropractor, threw up immediately following his treatment and now his eyes were no longer tracking together. I freaked. Thankfully someone already correctly pointed out that he was likely having a cerebellar stroke. He was. Bilateral vertebral artery dissection from aggressive cervical manipulation. It seriously messed him up. Doesn't happen very often. But it happens. Don't ever let a chiropractor touch you above your shoulders. I would look out the windows of gym every day and see this same man walk up the street, morbidly obese, 
using a shopping trolley to help him walk. Ulcerations all over his skin including his face. His whole body looked like it was eating away at him. I always remember thinking please god don't ever let me see him collapse. Another not me, but, one of my professors was a neurologist. He told us he used to stroll down the street with his neurologist friends and they diagnose some specific conditions based on the way people were walking. He refused to demonstrate this for the class, though. Just last week I tried to describe one of the dog park regulars as that lady with Parkinson's disease in the yellow lab. Shockingly, that wasn't enough of a description for my non-medical so. Not a doctor. I was on a plane from Philadelphia to Nassau. I was the aisle seat. And there were two men in my row. The guy with the window seat was overweight, 65 plus, with a CHF sounding cough, and looked like death warmed over. The flight was about 3 hours long. As soon as the seatbelt light went off, the window seat guy was up every 15-30 minutes to go to the washroom, when he'd come back he'd sit back and almost immediately start obstructive snoring. Then he'd snore wake himself up and then need to go to the bathroom. I was watching him like a hawk. My thought was he's not going to be alive in a year. I wonder does he know that? Doctors of Reddit. What is the most how the frick did that happen to you case you've seen? Not me but my best friend is a nurse. Said the worst thing she ever saw was a guy coming after a motorcycle wreck. He was still moving breathing etc in the ambulance but once he got to the air, they had to cut his helmet off. Apparently the helmet was the only thing keeping dude alive. Once his helmet came off his brains splattered everywhere and he was dead on the table. I guess that's why they're called brain buckets. Patient, a farmer, needed complete bed rest. He convinced me that he would rest at home so was discharged. Admitted two days later with a crushed foot. His explanation, a beast stood on it. He meant a cow. As someone whose entire extended family grew up farming, never trust a farmer to lie down and rest if they aren't either directly supervised or tied down to the bed. Grandma is currently on her fourth broken hip because she just will not stop climbing up on the nearest stool or chair or whatever every time she wants to reach something more than four feet off the ground. Not a doctor, but a witness to something. My family went to Disney World a few years ago and we met up with some family friends. On the Space Mountain ride, the husband raised his hands, his wedding ring got caught on something above him, and it ripped his finger almost completely off. It was hanging by a piece of skin. Thankfully he got into the air soon enough to save his finger, but he can't move it and doesn't have feeling in it. This is why I don't ever wear jewelry. Spent years as a marine aircraft mechanic and every 3 months they show you the same dang pictures of the same mishaps and remind you not to wear jewelry. I guess it took. Thanks for the reinforcement. There used to be a brand of vacuum cleaner looked like a sideways barrel on 4 wheels with a suction port on one end and an exhaust on the other. It was just the right height and circumference for doggy style non-organic humping. One year the new model comes out in the metal. High speed fan that provided the suction had been moved from the exhaust side to the suction side. That year a whole bunch of men appeared in us across the nation with the same story to explain penile lacerations. They were vacuuming in their bathrobe when somehow the robe opened and the penis got sucked into the vacuum. Not a doctor but a paramedic told me this one. Got a call to a house where a teenage boy had suffered a penis injury. Remember those glass stirring rods from science class? Kid took one home and put it down the eye of his penis. It broke. Shudder. My vagina just closed up in sympathy oh my god. God, so many. Not a doctor but a nurse practitioner in the air. Toy car in a condom in the butt. Giant pill bottle in the butt. The best is probably the guy who was being a good Samaritan and picking up the garbage bag in his neighbor's driveway and, sure enough, a needle slipped out and got lodged in his left AC. Our surgeon called him on his bulls, which was hilarious. S. H. User. Bulls. Really why can't people just get proper anal play toys? They're not that expensive. Ophthalmology here. I was called to the ED to examine a teenager for a gunshot to the eye. He heard a knock at the door, looked through the peephole and was shot directly in the eye. Unbelievably the bullet stayed within the orbit without penetrating the brain. So when I saw him his globe was ruptured. But he was playing a video game that I had to take away to examine him. 
My friend is a doctor and he once had a patient who accidentally shot his dong off because his gun went off in his pants. Still a third year med student, but my dad is a psychiatrist who used to work for the center for victims of torture. I knew it was a really bad day as a kid when he came home and just sat, watching us, crying. Ouch, this one hurt. I work at a hospital, and about a year ago, we had a guy come in that had injected car battery acid into his arms. So the ED doc had no clue how to treat him. Not sure what ultimately happened to the dude. This is a repost but a goodie. This was about 10 years ago when I was a pediatrics resident. I had a patient from a juvenile detention center admitted for sudden inability to walk or stand. He started peeing brown and it was found he had rhabdomyolysis, severe skeletal muscle breakdown, that was threatening to shut down his kidneys. He had no idea how this happened and claimed he woke up and suddenly couldn't use his legs. The second night of his admission his mom and sister came to visit. His mom left, but his sister stayed the night in his room. The next morning, I go to his room on rounds to discover this dude boning his sister in his hospital bed. Keep in mind this is a children's hospital with butterflies on the walls and little kids being pulled in wagons by their parents down the hallways. Needless to say, all heck broke loose and the truth came out. This sister was actually his girlfriend who was implicated in his weapons and drug charges and who he was forbidden by the court to have contact with. The cops came and dragged her away while she screamed and cussed us all out. Stunned parents of other patients looked on in horror. The guy's rhabdo eventually cleared and he didn't need to go on dialysis. He started to regain strength in his legs. Before discharge, he finally admitted what triggered the muscle breakdown and his leg weakness he did 1000 leg squats. All to get released from juvie and see his girlfriend. I presented the case at morning report the next day and called it the Sawshank Redemption. Not a doctor but a nurse. Patient had zero skin on his penis. Zero. It was nothing but the muscle. It's actually fascia not muscle. I was using muscle to help facilitate the image of what it looked like. I had to put special ointments and stuff on it. The reason being. Diabetes. Apparently his GF nicked him with a tooth during oral. Since diabetes creates delayed wound healing, it started becoming necrotic. But caught it early enough they could just remove the skin before it got into the deeper fascia and compartments of the penis. Otherwise dude Walder lost his junk. Not my patient, other than fellow residents. He's presenting an admission from the previous night to the attending senior physician. A woman with some intellectual disabilities and some stereotyped behaviors. One of which was picking at her scalp. Her caregivers had been trying to take care of this but finally brought her in when they noticed that the hole was getting kind of deep. My co-resident was describing the physical exam and said something like there was a 3 cm defect in the scalp that appeared to be about 4-5 cm deep. The attending interrupted him at that point and said wait, it can't be that deep. She'd be right through her skull and into her brain at that point. The resident coughed, looked uncomfortable, and said yes, that's correct. Let's get to the head CT. Basically this poor woman had picked her scalp to the point where she'd gone right through the skull and started to pick at her brain. Had a healthy 20 something guy come in coughing up a ton of blood. And I mean a ton. Was in the IQ. Getting unit after unit of blood. Intubated and bronchoscopy. Put a camera down the trachea to look at lungs. Performed and what do they find? A thumbtack. They successfully remove the thumbtack and guy recovers. Breathing tube removed. So we ask the guy, how the heck a thumbtack got in his lung? Turns out when he was 8 or 9 he played a game with his nares where they would see who could hold the most thumbtacks in their mouth. He must have inhaled one but it didn't cause problems for 10 plus years. Then he got bronchitis and was coughing a lot and must have moved the tack and caused it to puncture his lung. A little late but here we go. Not happened to me but to a friend of mine who works as a nurse in the emergency department. A young Turkish woman came to the hospital and had pain in her lady parts where something was stuck in. So my friend and her colleagues started to check and were completely baffled. There was a soap dispenser upside down in her vagina with the opening facing downwards. The dispenser thingy had been removed. It needed to be cut out because the bottle had been grown together with the walls in her vagina. Turns out this thing was stuck inside her over half a year and parts of said walls were growing inside the opening. 
My friend also said it was the worst smell she ever witnessed since months of period blood and other body fluids had gathered on top of the bottle. They assumed that the patient couldn't remove it herself due to vacuum and was too afraid or embarrassed to come to the hospital earlier. I'm always amazed at the idea of your body growing around things. Like, we've all seen trees do it, but my body can do that with enough time and effort. Insanely crazy. Male patient came into the ED with chief complaint of foreign body x-rays had showed a martini glass with an orange in it in the rectum. His wife came in, hysterical, saying I can't believe he's doing this stuff, again. I work in the operating room and have a former life in trauma. I have seen many, many things I wish I hadn't. A brief synopsis of a couple. Rectum. Dang near killed them. Worked in a case where an elderly gentleman lost a humongous sweet potato up his rectum. Had to cut the guy open to get it out. Most memorable was talking to him pre-op and him just saying over and over. I can't stay overnight. My wife can't find out. Word from someone who has been woken up more times in the night than I would like to admit. If you are going to put something in your rectum that was not specifically designed to go there. Think twice. Weigh how much pleasure you might get out of it against what it would be like to have to describe to multiple people why you had to go to the air. Had a newly married couple come in very embarrassed. They were vacationing and fooling around on their honeymoon and lost their vibrator. In the husband. Not too uncommon except this thing was huge. And still on. You could feel the vibration if you touched his pelvic bone which every resident in the hospital proceeded to come in and do. A young male presented with sepsis. Blood infection. He was knocking on death's door when his friend dropped him off. Poor guy had put a glass coke bottle up his bum. Which I guess isn't too odd. The problem here is he lost it and tried to retrieve it with some sort of tool breaking it in the process. It severed his sigmoid colon. Part of your large intestine closest to your anus. And leaked fecal contents into his pelvic cavity causing a severe infection. The general surgeon on call did a fantastic job creating a colostomy and cleaning him out but unfortunately the patient didn't survive. Guess this just turned into the bad butt stuff thread. Oh well. I'll save my other messed up stories for some other thread. TLDR. Don't put things up your butt that aren't meant to go there. There are plenty of commercial products. Or just use your own. Or another's. Anatomy. Not a doctor, but my grandpa, Rip Grandpa, was a heart surgeon and also in a doc for a while. He told me this story about his time in the air, Hungarian accent. So I vast there in the office, when a man came in with a look of absolute pain. I asked was wrong and he said it would be better discussed in private. It turned out that he caught his penis on his zipper. All I could do was give a good yank. Cue me cringing at the thought of that and grandpa with a big butt grin on his face. I love you grandpa. Back in 1972 I worked in ED and had a 5 year old boy come in with his 7 year old brother. Big brother tried to help little brother zip his pants up. But alas his penis got zipped up in the zipper. Little guy was beyond crying and big brother was feeling real bad about it. It still makes me cringe. And yes I have seen worse plus assisted in over 500 autopsies. It. People doing messed up crap to themselves because they're on drugs. People waiting too long to get help until it's dire. And people shoving stuff up their buttholes and or vaginas. Why did I read this thread in its entirety? Why? I heard a GP discuss his most unusual encounters in the emergency department and one of the things included people's fascination with pushing objects through orifices in their body, mainly their rectum but also included penile urethras and stomas. He showed an x-ray of the rectum with an orange and a coat hanger stuck while the guy tried to pull out the orange. Another was a doorknob, which the guy accidentally fell onto and his friend had to dislodge the entire door and bring him into ED with the door rested on his back. The GP said part of the struggle dealing with these fetishes was not to laugh. Not my story, but a former EMT firefighter friend of mine was called to a house where an older lady hasn't been answering calls or her door for about two weeks. After searching the house, they could smell someone was dead. They saw the ladder to the attic. He went up and saw she had been decomposing in hot, humid Georgia summer, in her attic after having a heart attack. We saw the same person come through emergency for facial burns three times in six weeks because they couldn't grasp the concept of not smoking while on oxygen. This occurred in SE Georgia. 
A woman called up the hospital and told the nurse, I've got lease in my vagina. I'm sorry, did you say that you had lease in your vagina? Yes, I have lease in my vagina. What kind of leafs? I don't know. Green ones. Have you tried to brush them out? They are up in there. So the nurse has the woman come into the air to be seen by a doctor. She comes in, the doctor looks at the problem and the woman is sent into surgery for an emergency hysterectomy. Someone was taught to use a potato slice as birth control, but then forgot to remove the slice after having sex. Warm, dark, damp space is the perfect place to grow a potato plant. Which is exactly why this woman had leaves in her vagina. This is all pretty disappointing really. All the years of warnings we received. The constant harping from our mothers. And not a single running with scissors story. That's because of the years of warnings. When I was a med student on trauma surgery. Assisted a case for removal of a trichobazor. Which is a hairball in the stomach. Nastiest smell ever. The surgeon had me take a picture of it after putting it back in a stomach shape. Imagine when you pull wet hair from the drain but infinitely worse. The lady had trichotillomania, which is a compulsive need to eat hair. It was a third surgery for the same reason. I have yet to see Rapunzel syndrome, which is when there is hair from the stomach all the way to the colon. Trichotillomania is the compulsion to pull out one's hair, not eat it. Trichophagia is the disorder you are describing. So not a doctor but a medical technician. This definitely isn't as graphic as some of the other stories but the interesting thing is that it happened yesterday. We had a patient who was on a ladder. I believe he was trying to change a light bulb and fell off the ladder. He broke every single one of his ribs and gave himself a hemothorax. That's when blood gets into the pleural space making it difficult to breathe. He was rather young too. 40s to 50s. As soon as I read he fell off the ladder I was expecting the light bulb to have ended up in his rectum. My. Ex. Bill was doing his residency at the county hospital in Chicago. A homeless woman came in suffering from a bad infection. While examining her he did a gynecological exam. He was studying to be a gynecologist. He noticed something in her vagina. Reached in a pulled out a few dollars in paper money at which point she started screaming at him to give it back. Which he did. She'd hide her money in her vagina for safekeeping. So yeah, you don't know where that dollar in your pocket has been. Not a doctor but a nurse. During my surgery clinical we get an obese gentleman in for hernia surgery. The gentleman stands with his walker to transfer to the surgery table. Gets put under and doc lifts the gown. This guy's scrotum were as big as a beach ball. No crap. The man's nuts were bigger than his chubby bald head. It took 6 hands to move his sack around to get him prepped for surgery. Doc removed 5-7 pounds of abdominal fat. Pushed some of the omentum. The curtain of fat everyone has to protect their organs. And a loop of gut back up into abdomen. Then he gets rid of 2. Football sized fluid sacks called hydrosols. Then finishes trimming and tucking everything in. During the procedure the man's penis went from an invisible innie to actually a couple inches of flaxid hang. The doc doing the procedure was hilarious. At one point he handed me a large bowl of freshly removed fat and told, Here miss student nurse. It's like play doh he also mused about whether he could bill insurance for penis enlargement. So men over it. The moral of the story is don't forget to do the turn your head and cough test on occasion and if you do have a hernia don't ignore it for 6 plus years. Not a doctor but I thought I should share. A few years back. My dad had a minor heart issue while running. He's fine. Anyway, we took him to the hospital a few days later to run some additional tests. So we're sitting in the lobby area and some guy comes through the front doors. With a blue tea towel on his head. Soaked in blood. He had little trickles of fresh blood dripping down his head. We stare at him for a bit until the receptionist asks him what's wrong. He says hi, I got the axe through my head again. My dad and I were trying to contain our laughter, wondering if we'd misheard him. When the receptionist picks up the phone, dials a number and says hey, Todd's here again. Yep, yep, the axe. Well send him in. She seemed so undisturbed by the incident. It was a little creepy. We saw him walk away but didn't see him again. Mother-in-law was a doctor. We asked her this one day. 99% of the time she wouldn't tell you anything. She was a good doctor a eh? Privilege. Etc. One day we got her drunk. That is. She had like 2 sips of wine and lost her crap. Loose lips sink ships. 
But all she'd tell us was one day the son of a huge celebrity, she wouldn't give any hints, at all, as to who, came in, and he was something like 8 years old, and he had a crazy hard weird spot on his leg, there was a scar over top, kid couldn't or wouldn't give any explanation except it hurt, and the celebrity wanted it taken care of right now, she was a great doctor, and accompanied them to the air, uh, cause, that's where you go for insanity, not your family doc. It was a dinky car, under the skin, wound or whatever healed over. Doctors are allowed to talk about patients as long as they don't mention names or identifying information. That's not breaking any rules. Not a doctor but a nurse. When I was still training we had a woman come in the ear complaining of abdominal pain. After an x-ray they figured out what was wrong and the story came out. She had been masturbating with glass pop bottle and somehow lost it up there and then just forgot about it. That was a few days prior to her visit to the air. That same clinical rotation we had a guy come in with a foot wound so infected and cared for that when the nurse took his sock off maggots fell out. My mom is an NP and works in the air. One day she called me and told me how an old man was drunk and had put a zip tie around his penis and proceeded to tighten it as much as possible. I don't know what they did to fix it. I assume they cut the zip tie off but it makes you wonder. I saw some kid that was visibly in agony because there was a massive hole in his left hand. I'm talking about the palm. It was bleeding like crazy and he needed two other people to compress his hand completely. He couldn't even scream. All that I heard were gusps and pants like he was dying. Nightmares were had that night. When I was a medical student, I scrubbed an on a penectomy case. Yes, the removal of a penis. The guy had a gigantic, fungating, necrotic penile squamous cell cancer. I had never met him, but when he rolled back to the oar, he was still in the gown with a large bulky dressing on his penis. He kept telling us to be careful since his penis was so sore. Once he was intubated and anesthetized, we took off the dressing. I was in no way prepared for what I saw, and even less prepared for what I smelled. His dong was encompassed by this gigantic cantaloupe sized tumor that smelled like what I imagine the zombies on Walking Dead smell like. It was as if a skunk had died a year ago, been eaten by another skunk, reanimated, and crawled out of the butt of the skunk that ate it. We all dove for the bottle of oil of wintergreen, doused our masks with it, and breathed a shallow sigh of relief as my attending pointed at it and said that that is what denial looks like. The guy had clearly let this go for years before seeking care. Still by far the worst thing I've ever smelled. I will never forget it. Not my story but one I've been told from a nurse. A man came to the ear to get some narcs. He kept asking the nurse when he was going to see a doctor and she had said that there were patients who are more severe right now that take priority. Without a beat the man goes into the bathroom and cuts off his penis walks out to the nurse and puts it on her table and says can I see a doctor now and she just straight face said yup. Apparently every male doctor or nurse who went into his room after all came out looking like they had just seen a ghost. OHH man I've seen a lot. From things stuck in butts that are not supposed to be there, to tumors that eat half the patient's face, or a 20 kilogram abdominal tumor that has been growing for years. Many times I've seen infections gone out of control, where you can clearly tell this has been going on for months. For example, myosis. Maybe all of this is more of a how the frick did you let this happen. I have a lot of photos somewhere. Maybe I'll make an album sometime and do an AMA. I'm a surgeon BTW. My mill told me the story of a lady that had come in complaining of abdominal pain and smelling absolutely foul. Turns out she had tried using a potato as a sexual toy and was able to get it full inserted inside her vagina but couldn't pull it out. So she decided to leave it in there with the hopes that it would work its way out. It sprouted inside of her and then eventually started to rot. They had to surgically remove it. She also told me the story of a guy that had a surgery for something and while in recovery had asked her for some tampons. She was confused but gave him some anyway. Turns out he had so much rough gay sex that his sphincter no longer worked correctly and he used the tampons to keep his butt from leaking. Nurse here. Had a patient who scratched her eye with her nail and waited over a week to get care for it when it was clearly infected. Sore. Swollen. Red. Irritated. Pus. It looked so bad. She had to have her eyeball removed. Not a doctor or nurse, but I'm an EMT and I've worked in an ER. An elderly man was brought in from home. 
dementia, Alzheimer's, and a bunch of other things as well, so he's bedridden. The stench when he was brought in was terrible, so I grabbed my trusty mini tub of Vicks Vapor Rub, sneezy done under my nose and go to help clean this guy up and see what's going on. While cleaning him, we realize he's coated in dried hardened fesses. This wasn't the worst post though, as we were trying to clean the decal matter off of him, his skin was peeling away. It, don't stick anything but specifically designed dildos or your partner up in there, if it's discolored, leaking or stinks, go to the ear it's an infection and or gangrene, stop doing weird crap with drugs and use clean equipment in the proper areas if you're gonna do it, leave the penis alone. My mother-in-law is a paramedic who this year attended a scene where an older person has suffered a heart attack and passed away in their home, leaving two cute little poodles alone in the house. The neighbor called in with concerns that she hadn't seen or heard from the neighbor in a couple of days. When she arrived, the two cute little, now blood-stained, poodles had eaten the woman's entire arms up to the shoulder. Not a doctor, or anything like that, but maybe this fits. Long, long ago I was a submarine sailor. Henry had to spend 12 hours a day on lower level and guy room watch, because we were short-handed. But you don't get a lot of visitors in lower level engine room. Henry told us he was getting messages from God in the flow tones from the condensate pumps. In most environments this might be cause for concern, but submarines are not most environments. Also, as I said, we were short-handed. One day the voice in the flow tones told him he was supposed to have been Jewish. He attempted to circumcise himself with a pair of diagonal cutters, passed out before completion. Our doc, hospital corpsman, told us to talk it over with him prior to attempting self-surgery. This might get controversial, if I learned from previous Reddit experience relating this story. My mom is a nursing supervisor. They run the hospital and are at every hospital code. A 40 year old male came into the hospital with all the symptoms of a stoke, but he was deteriorating and desaturating crazy fast. He arrested shortly after desaturating and they couldn't revive him. After they did a post-mortem, it was found that he bled out internally. When the family was questioned for the cause of the bilateral carotid dissection, they learned he had seen a chiropractor that day to receive a neck adjustment. His neck was moved incorrectly and both of his carotid, neck, arteries were torn. But my mom told me this story the morning after her shift and the way she said he just died right there was haunting. I've been told horror stories from the hospital all my life, but this is one that will remain as one of my mother's most gruesome tales from the hospital. Doctors of Reddit, what's the creepiest thing you've encountered while on the job? RN here, I took care of a lady once. She nearly died of sepsis, blood infection. She'd had multiple strokes and coded multiple times in the IQ. They'd given her levofed. Levofed or leave em dead is what we say because levofed shunts blood from your extremities to your vital organs, usually resulting in necrosis, death of peripheral tissues. This means when she came to me her fingers and toes were all black. She wasn't quite right. And I've seen lots of crazy, but she truly unnerved me. She never talked, only whispered in this bright bubbly voice, like a little girl's, but she said awful things, like can you push me outside so I can chew my fingers off and she would smile all time. She also had some really bad pressure ulcers, bed sores, from just basically being immobile for so long. We had to dress her wounds daily, she'd usually rip the dressings off pretty soon after we put them on. One night I went into her room and saw a piece of what I thought was dressing on the floor. Upon closer examination, it was a chunk of her own skin. A partially healed skin graft to be exact, still gives me shivers. Not a doctor, but I work in a personal care home. We used to have a resident who would constantly yell out hello, drove us a bit bonkers. After he passed away a lady moved into the room. One night I was working a double. Evening tonight, she pulled her call bell. I went in and she asked me to make him stop. Make who stop what? The old man standing beside the bed. He won't stop yelling hello. How do you just not quit your job and move to Kuwait after that? Not a doc but I am an EMT. Honestly old demented women holding baby dolls. They pet em and crap. That baby is real to them. Freaks me the heck out. While on an infectious disease elective. I took care of a patient with a brain abscess, 
The abscess had knocked out the language centers of the patient's brain resulting in an aphasia. His words were completely scrambled 90% of the time. Ironically, the patient was a computer scientist software engineer responsible for coding groundbreaking voice recognition technology. The irony really creeped me out. I worked in an R and the creepiest thing I can remember wasn't so much an event as a look. A 4 month old child was brought in because it had basically suffocated in its crib due to neglect. The mother was there, watching her baby die and maybe it was the drugs still coursing through her system. Maybe it was the shock. But watching as one of our priests tells her outside the trauma bay heaven has claimed your daughter, the glassy, thousand mike stare she gave as she asked if there were police going to her house and if she could go home. Something that utterly wrecked everyone an hour and she had this otherworldly, totally distant look because she was thinking about how she's going to get busted. But some days, your faith in humanity is tested. Not a doctor, but both of my parents were. So here's a couple of the weirder stories I remember. Mum was in a dock. One night a guy came in who had tried to commit suicide. He had used a shotgun, but had stuck it under his chin instead of in his mouth and had angled it wrong so that he just blew most of his face off instead. Apparently he only lived about a block from the hospital so he just walked over with no jaw or nose and only one eye. Basically just a couple of bloody, rasping holes instead of a face. He was in such a state of shock that he just calmly walked in and sat down in the waiting area. The other is much less gory, and mostly just weird. After retiring dad worked in geriatric care for a few of the nursing homes around town. One guy had this really weird affliction that I can't remember the name of, but it caused him to have really weird hallucinations. Like snakes coming out of his nose and mouth. The strange part was that he was completely lucid and actually really intelligent, and my dad would talk to him frequently. They would be discussing films or philosophy, and the guy would occasionally calmly say, hang on a second, and then proceed to pull a two foot invisible snake out of his nose. He'd lay it on the ground, and then it apparently would slither away. He could talk about them and describe them in complete detail. Wish I could remember some others. There was one they told when I was a kid that had something to do with a radioactive alligator, but I don't remember the details. Also I kind of think that particular one might have been one of those stories. A friend of mine is an EMT around Chicago. They gets a lot of calls for homeless people who die during the winter. If they don't find them quickly enough the body cools and any exposed skin freezes to the ground. They have to scrape the people from the sidewalk before they can remove the body. A woman with schizophrenia had the delusion that men were ejaculating on her head constantly. So, she would smash her noggin with rocks when available to purify herself. The repair I saw, one of many as it turns out, as this was something she did frequently, required neurosurgery, for the skull crania plastic prosthetic for the ruined skin and bone, and plastic surgery, to bring the skin together just right. She had a helmet for as long as I knew her. I have never encountered a severer case of self-harm, excepting suicides, as this woman. Sad to hear as it probably stemmed from childhood sexual abuse. Nurse, not doctor, but I had a 91 year old woman who came in with a stroke. She was unresponsive and breathing at about 44 respirations per minute, hyperventilating. This went on for about 3 days. We were waiting for grandma to kick the bucket any minute. All of a sudden her bed alarm went off. We figured it was a visitor who had leaned on her bed too hard, because that can send it off. So I don't exactly bolt to her room. When I get in there, she is sitting up, legs swung over the side of the bed, yelling I need to pee I get her to the commode, and get her back to bed. She starts bawling, saying she wants to see her husband, who is long dead. She died two days later. Not a doctor, but a nursing student studying psychiatric and geriatric nursing. We spend 12 hours shifts at the hospital nursing home, twice a week and usually rotate patients. One of the things that constantly freaks me out is when a patient says something like, I'm dying. They usually do die within a couple days, if not hours after having said that. At one of the nursing homes we did clinical at, they take this as a very serious ominous sign. I've seen this in both critical care patients and patients who are expected to discharge that same week. It's not uncommon for them to say they see their parents, loved ones, etc and then pass away shortly after. Not saying every patient that said that has died, 
but I've seen enough that I take it seriously and it gives me the spooks. Not a doctor but care provider in a home for developmentally disabled adults. Some details changed for anonymity privacy. A long-time client whose mentality interests were comparable to 4 6-year-old would cover his head with the bedding when he went to bed. When staff playfully asked him what he was doing, he'd tell staff he was hiding from the ghosts. He never identified the ghosts and did this for years so staff always thought it was just the client being playful. At one point this client didn't want to do his normal routine like eat, drink, stay up to watch television, or use the restroom. While bathing, the client said he was seeing ghosts and pointed. Staff replied, what ghosts and the client said, my mom and dad, gonna take me home. Staff gently reminded the client that his parents had already passed away, that they couldn't possibly take him out that weekend. Within 72 hours of telling staff he saw the ghosts of his mom and dad, that client went to the air, was admitted to the hospital, and passed away. I was the one that had spent half the night in the air with that client. I had taken him to the air before and other routine medical appointments. This client was known for being rather combative during such visits but was unusually peaceful the entire time the last time he went to the air. When I went to the client's memorial, I told the client's family that I thought he knew it was his time based on how calm he was. I didn't disclose the part about seeing ghosts of his parents shortly before the air visit. When I was working as a critical care nurse, I sent my patient down for a heart catheterization. She was so sweet. And I remember that she and I were joking about a bunch of different things before she went down for her procedure. When she came back, she was very drowsy, as is expected from the first, but very very confused. She proceeded to have IQ psychosis due to the sedatives. Every time I would come in the room, she she would throw cups of water at me and yell at me. She would make this guttural noise, and tell me that I was the devil. I walked in one time, and she said, Dear Lord, Please come down and slit this woman's throat. She continued to say this kind of stuff. She told her husband that I was walking into her room with poison balls and trying to kill her. She said that my skin was falling off of my face. She scratched and hit me. It was very sad and scary. I hadn't seen this happen prior to this. We had to give her antipsychotics and restrain her initially to keep her from hurting herself. It was pretty terrible. Not a doctor, but as an EMT a few years ago I came across the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. So to set the stage a bit, it's the middle of August and it's over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius outside, with 70% or higher humidity, real miserable conditions outside. We get a call to help the police with a welfare check. Basically the police knock on an elderly person's door and make sure they're still alive or need anything. This was after the neighbors had gotten worried about the over 90 year old woman who lived in the house. She hadn't been seen in about 2-3 weeks. From what we were told, the responding officer checks all of the doors and windows and gets no response. So we pull up the contact info from our last visit to her house. The young gung ho rookie cop got the okay to break in to check. So he goes to break down the front door. He runs up to kick it and slips as he's giving the kick and falls into a bush. He finally got it right the second time and knocked the door in. Meanwhile me and my partner are laughing our asses off at him. The next moment he set foot in the house and turned right around. He was stopped cold by the smell. That's when we knew we didn't have a patient, but a body to find. So a little more background to the environment. This house didn't have air conditioning, and was sealed up tight. No windows were open or anything. Add in the temperatures outside in the previous month and you have an oven of a house. We were walking into a house that had a dead person sitting in it for over two weeks in an oven. So we go inside, and the most horrific, eye-watering smell hits us. It's indescribable how bad it was. We could taste it it was that intense. The only words I have for describing it was airborne death. So while we are gagging and trying to search the house, we finally found her body. She had been taking a bath, and somehow managed to die and fall into the water. Think bony, festering maggot soup and that's what we saw in that bathroom. We took one look and nope the frick out of the house. I still have nightmares about that sight. And the smell. That smell comes to mind every time somebody talks about the smell of death. The ME thought that she may have slipped and struck her head and drowned. Or she stroked out and drowned in the tub. I watched a patient's heart stop on the monitor once. There are false alarms sometimes of course. 
However, I was experienced enough to know that it was true alarm. I called the nurse and told her she might want to check the patient. I remember her laughing nervously to tell me that she was talking with the patient at that moment so she could not possibly be dying. I could even hear the patient talking to her cheerfully in the background. I double checked the monitor and saw a few beats here and there and Lu along lines. Just as I was advising the nurse to manually check the patient I heard her drop the phone and go. Oh no followed by the code blue alarm. That patient did not come back. <laughs> nurse here. Once I had a hospice patient. I went in to check on them and asked if they wanted breakfast. They said no. I'm dying. After a few minutes of assessments and small talk I went to get their pain medication. I was gone for 10 minutes. When I got back they were indeed dead. The creepy part is that their watch has stopped 5 minutes before I entered the room. A regular quartz watch. I was only gone for 10 minutes. I can't explain. Also, I checked. The pin was in the watch so he didn't turn it off. My trauma nurse friend told me she was caring for a patient who unexpectedly coded. She had to run out of the room for more supplies and when she got to the supply closet, what she needed wasn't there. She said, frick 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 and got supplies she needed from somewhere else. The patient survived. The next day, she was tending to the patient who said, you know, you shouldn't use words like that. The patient went on to explain that she saw my friend, the nurse, saying frick in the supply room. There was no way she could have. She was dead on the table down the hall. But the patient described exactly what happened as if she was there. While I was in nursing school I did rotations in a smaller. We had done compressions on a full arrest for quite a while and the doctor finally called it. Afterwards they called it I was asked to do post-mortem care. As I was rolling the patient with a co-worker. The patient was rolled towards me and almost up against my body as the nurse cleaned her backside. At that moment she began to vomit and she kept vomiting. All over my white scrubs. Vomit sucks. But a dead lady vomiting on you takes it to a whole other level. My mom works in the local and sees a lot of interesting stuff. I'm relaying the stories she's told me. Once there was a guy who'd been stabbed who was being wheeled in and was still in shock so he wasn't really feeling the pain yet. He was eviscerated and was holding his intestines trying to push them back in and the docs and nurses had to retrain him from trying to do so so he wouldn't damage them further. To anyone who's had bile drains like me, this will make you cringe. Guy in prison has end stage liver failure and has external biliary drains. These are drains that are screwed into the bile ducts in the liver. He gets into a fight with another inmate, and the other inmate grabs the patient's bile drains and rips them out. Jeez, just typing that makes my stomach hurt in sympathy pain. I had bile drains for the same reason for months on end and just a slight accidental tug on them hurt like holy heck. Patient came in with large abscess that requires lancing. Doctor goes and starts injecting lidocaine to numb the skin before cutting. As he's telling the patient just about done with the shot, boom. Abscess explodes all over his face. He wears glasses so his eyes were protected but everything else got splattered with pus and nastiness. He promptly excused himself, walked to the supply closet and grabbed a few bottles of rubbing alcohol and proceeded to get into the decontamination shower and dumps the bottles over his head. He said it took many showers to feel remotely clean again. Ugh. So gross. There's also a frequent flyer who's a very large gay guy. He always comes in complaining of rectal bleeding or bloody stool so the doctors are forced to do a rectal exam. When they do this the guy moans and basically gets off of the digital check. Really creepy and gross. So of course the head docs send in the residents or newer techs as a joke. One guy came back and flipped them all off yelling frick all you guys and my mom at the desk with all the docs and nurses busted out laughing. Last one for now. There was a couple who did some drug together. I think it was crack. The guy beats his girlfriend to death and they're both brought in. The guy is cuffed to the bed while the team works to try and save the woman. Meanwhile all this guy can do is be about how he's hungry and demands a food tray or turkey sandwich. Standard hospital issue. Eventually the head doc goes in and tells him to shut the heck up. That they're not a restaurant and they don't owe him crap. It was pretty satisfying for every staff member in the air. In my early internship, a young unmarried woman was admitted to surgical ward for emergency laparotomy. Her family seemed least concerned about the agony of abdominal pain she was in. 
Her abdomen was opened and there was a fetus and uterus or the tubes I don't remember now with evidence of instrumentation by the quacks for inducing abortion which is illegal in hospitals in my country resulting in uterine and intestinal perforation. The family was brutally indifferent since she had brought a bad name to them. Vet clinic story. Graphic warning. I was interning at a local clinic when I was younger and I had the opportunity to sit in on a one you cat getting spayed. Now I have a pretty strong stomach and I've seen stuff like that before but I was not prepared. But now the surgeon was a real fun lady. She was all about showing me the real side of being a vet. Fair enough because to be honest. It sucks and there's a lot of nasty stuff you see do. She opens up the poor cat and announces that she's pregnant and asks me if I want to see the babies. Gross I thought but why not. I poke my head over and she lifts out the womb. Terrible looking stuff. She points out several lumps along it and tells me that's the fetuses. She places a small incision above one of them and then goes to squeeze one out when. Pop. Not a fetus. Bit a big. Stream of pus comes spraying out of the womb right up onto the surgeon's face. She freezes. The assisting surgeon starts frantically getting this crap off her and I get to witness the greatest string of profanity I'd ever heard from a woman her age. Turns out the poor cat had pyometra, an infection of the womb that when undiagnosed looks like undeveloped pregnancy. Fun day. Got to go home early while they cleaned up. Don't worry the cat was absolutely fine. After she cleaned off her face she finished removing the tissue and got the cat on antibiotics. My girl was a vet tech. This dog came in that had done crap in a while. Owners swear the dog couldn't have ate anything. They finally do exploratory. Doctor cuts into the stomach or whatever and there is this huge eye staring out from inside the dog. Doctor pulls out a large stuffed bunny with oversized plastic eyes. I am the creepiest thing. I'm a male anesthesiologist. When I was about 40 I had a female patient about the same age for a breast biopsy. I started to sedate her with a medicine like Valium and the nurses began to drape her with her breast exposed. The surgeon was one of my favorites. A fun female who I enjoyed talking to. She often wore funny items such as cute socks. I asked her, any interesting socks today just then my patient asked in a very distraught voice. What did you say I replied. Somewhat confused by the sudden outburst. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the surgeon and asking if she was wearing any interesting socks oh. She said. I thought you said. Any interest in sex today yup. Imagine you are a 40 yo female and your 40 yo male anesthesiologist gives you a sedative and asks if you are interested in sex once your breast is exposed. People criticizing nurses for posting here, but they are the only ones who spend any amount of real time with the patients. I would hardly expect any doctors to have one stroke eighth of the stories the nurses would have of the same patients. And EMTC patients at their roist, so although I have little experience with them, I'm sure they have plenty more stories, too. I think this question was directed to the wrong people. Can we use a nice? General medical professionals? I just hate to see nurses get crap on. Not me, but a family friend who was an EMT got a call that a dead homeless man was found in the woods. When he went to retrieve the guy body, they found that it had been partially eaten by something. He says there were organs trailing in different directions all around the body. Wolves, coyotes. I used to work with dogs. One of my co-workers told me about a doctor who lost his license because a woman woke up early from surgery and saw him zipping his pants and wiping her face off. The doctor got nervous and told the husband don't worry if she says she saw some crazy stuff. It's common with anesthesia. The wife told the husband what she saw and the husband got suspicious. They drove to the police station instead of driving home and the police swabbed her face. Turns out he jacked off on her face while she was unconscious. Not a doctor, but as a nurse's aide, I can tell you that the way some people get at night when they have Alzheimer's is really really weird and creepy. I worked in transport for almost two years, in school to be a nurse blah blah blah. The most terrifying thing for me would be one late shift in transport. We store our stretchers on an unused unit, fourth floor way in the back, old building. We have since the start of the hospital in 1951 added to it. Now this unit used to be the old psych unit before it was shut down. It had unique room layouts and doors with windows and custom locks. Well I was putting a stretcher back up there in the room where we store them when I just felt like I was being watched. 
I walked out into the hallway and asked if anyone was there. Usually a fellow transporter would sleep in one of the far rooms because he would work a morning shift but lived far away and didn't want to drive back. Anyways, no one responded but as I stood there and surveyed the hallway, the wheelchair that was against the wall just decided to start rolling by itself a few feet as if it was nudged by something. I promptly noped the frick off that unit. I never went back alone. When I was on my OBGYN rotation we had a patient who had to come in for an MRI scan. Usually before MRIs you have to declare if you have any metal implants. She was like ah oh, yeah I do. It's in my vagina. Turns out she had a be a bottle cap inside. And it was lodged in there for 12 years. The bottle cap was so fused to the vaginal wall that we had to use bone forceps to break off the fibrous tissue that was encasing it. After we removed that cap. We found another two more inside. Fun times. Trauma nurse here. Hope I may comment. Several times over the years, we've had patients who were victims of violent crime, gunshot wounds, stabbings, car versus pedestrian, arson, etc. Where the perpetrator turned out to be a family member who'd been visiting them in the hospital the whole time, while the patient was comatose and said family member had not yet been named as a suspect. Some of these perpetrators turned out to be murderers, as some of the patients would go on to die from their injuries. Takes a lot to creep out a trauma team, but knowing you've been in a tiny room with a violent criminal and their victim makes you uneasy, even if you know you're never going to see them again. I'm not even a doctor so this most likely isn't relevant, but I've spent months of my adolescence in the city's children's hospital, incarcerated in multiple wards, most prominently the psych ward. After 9pm there are nurses on guard duty patrolling each dormitory in case anybody tries to escape and harm themselves during the night. The dormitories are very small, only 4 rooms holding up to 2 people, so it's practically impossible to get past the guard. Regardless, I kept my door locked in case. At around 3am I'm awoken from my slumber by breathing. I groggily disregard it, assuming that it's my roommate, before remembering that my roommate had left the day before. Nope, it's the freaking manic depressive bipolar girl who managed to sneak past the night watchman, unlock my door and watch me sleep. I have no idea how long she was there for, but she just smiled and then backed out of the room. When I woke up, there were tiny shards of plastic and glass all over the floor. That place was freaking mental. No pun intended. <laughs> Dentist here. One time I had an old lady come in with a porcelain crown in a bag. She asked me if I could resment it for her. I looked at her tooth and it was in pretty good shape. Looked at the crown and realized that it had some brown gunk in it. She reported that she had swallowed the crown and had been extra vigilant as she sat on the toilet for the next couple of days. It's okay. I soaked it in alcohol for 24 hours she told me. Without being rude I surmise that the brown material must have been poop. Gross huh? Well, it gets better. In order to resment the crown it needs to be clean on the inside and at the time I didn't have our fancy sandblasting air abrasion machine. I had to do it the old fashioned way, with a drill. So here's a quick, practical dental lesson for you. A crown that has come off, son fecal matter in it has an incredibly pungent smell. Lovingly called the under the crown smell, it is a combination of skunk, old man pits and mothballs. As you drill it out it produces heat, smoke and dust, and smells like burning skunk, old man pits and mothballs. If you use water to minimize the smoke it splashes all over you and then you stink like the aforementioned trio. So I elected to remove the poo and old cement without water so at least I wouldn't smell like a Stanley steamer sandwich for the rest of the day. I took my diamond impregnated crown drill and went to work on what I can only describe as a turd hot box. My whole office smelled like someone had made an anal sacrifice to Pele the volcano god. Now, if you've ever sat next to a campfire you'll know that smoke can make your clothes skin hair stink. Thus the awesome strategy of not using water as coolant backfired and I wound up smelling like roasted dingleberries for the rest of the day. Anyway, we resmented the crown and saved her $1000 at the expense of our olfactories. Every time we see her we think of her poo tooth headset. TL. DR. Lady ate a crown. Fished it out of her poo. We cleaned it out and glued it back in her mouth. Stunk like burning poo for a while. 
back in high school I volunteered to hang out with folks in the geriatric depth of the hospital on the weekends. There was a mix of people there most were pretty nice people but there was one guy with pretty severe Alzheimer's. Completely off the grid mentally. He would throw things at nurses hated hospital food. One day I was talking to one of the patients in the hallway and he overheard me talking and yelled at me to come talk about the weather. I said okay and as soon as I got to the door the stench hit me and he screamed in absolute horror what is this? WHO did this while pointing at a pile of fesses in his bed. Nope. 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 I will never work in healthcare but I highly recommend volunteering at your local hospital to visit the aging population because depression is rampant and most rarely have visitors family only visits once or twice a year. One little old lady was confined to her room because doctors were unsure what she had but it was something bad because there was an actual biohazard warning on her door and nurses needed special masks and scrubs to enter the room. I was not permitted to see her but she poked her head out of the door slightly once and said she wished someone would come visit her and stop being scared of her. She had tears in her eyes. I almost cried after my shift. People have read it with medical conditions that doctors don't believe you about. What's your story? Serious. I had Giardia in college. Went to the nurse on campus. She gave me a condescending talk about trying Imodium first before I bothered the all-important student health with something like diarrhea. I was crapping blood and mucus. And yes I told her this. I then called my parents after the double doses of Imodium didn't work and they came and took me to the local hospital. I crap in a cup for the doc at the hospital and he came back and said I was dehydrated but fine. I had filled the cup with mostly blood and mucus. At this point my dad said something along the lines of, you must be fine because two medical professionals said so. I cried and begged my mother to believe me, and she took me to a G specialist in a larger city, who had me crap in a cup again. At this point I was emaciated and crapping my brains out if I took even a sip of water. He gave me flagell and I lived to tell about it. Giardia is rough. I've had it twice. Didn't get it treated for a few months the first time round and as a result still can't quite handle dairy properly two years on. In an unrelated event one of my mates got it from accidentally spraying baboon crap into her mouth. So at least it wasn't that. For 6 years I got occasional headaches really bad behind one eye socket. It would happen every 4-6 weeks and unbearable headache would last 3-4 days solid. No Tylenol or meds worked. Told doctor it felt so painful it felt like it would feel better if I jammed a pipe through my eye socket for relief. We tracked my cycle. I went off nuvering. Tracked headaches on a calendar. She thought it could be dehydration or related to the weather. Sinus. Nothing was a pattern. Year later. Got a script from my primary doctor that if I took the injection at the very beginning of a headache it would go away for good. But if I wasn't able to take it right away. Like an hour later. The shot didn't work at all. I thought I had a sinus infection. Went to went in the town I worked. He treated me like a druggie and he inspected my toes for needle marks. Because I came in and had mentioned that I thought it could be a cluster headache. He was a very old man and said I was telling him I had exactly all of the symptoms to a T of a cluster headache and most people don't have all of them. By his reasoning I was making it up. Yes I had done many WebMD searches trying to figure out any and all things it could be. The eye doctor did a picture thing to look at back of my eye. All was fine. So no tumor. Had an MRI and CAT scan. They came back fine. The neurologist just extended my script saying that as long as those meds work to keep it up. But I didn't want to manage it. I wanted to find a cure. Went back to eye doctor a year later. Still nothing found. Finally got my primary doctor to write me a referral for blood work. Ended up that it was my thyroid issue. Been on meds for over a year and a half and haven't had a headache in that entire time. So thankful to know what it actually was. For a long time it was a running joke with my husband that I was going to die young and I told family to perform autopsy that they would see I had a cantaloupe sized tumor behind my eye. Ha. Huh. Glad that's not the case though but seriously took a long time to figure out. Some doctors, not all, don't believe I'm allergic to Benadryl since it's an antihistamine. It's about 60 stroke 40 believe me to don't believe me. My throat closed when I took it for allergies once. Yes, I've been to an allergist who confirmed it for me. It's way more controversial than I would have ever thought. Especially to pediatricians when I disclose that I'm allergic for my son's records. Anyone can be allergic to anything. 
including Benadryl. However, such allergies, especially if you have numerous allergies to meds foods act may actually be an involuntary psychogenic, functional, response. Lots of research is looking at this since we are encountering more and more people with unusual or numerous true allergic responses. For months I had trouble eating and was losing weight which as an already skinny guy was a problem. During this time any time I ate it felt like the food was catching in my throat and I eventually had to throw it back up. This led to me being sent through multiple doctors who all took blood samples and sent me to a psychiatrist to treat my for bulimia or other eating disorders. So for months I slowly starved while trying to explain to doctors that I do in fact want to eat it's just impossible for me. Finally, they sent me to do a barium swallow just to prove to me I'm perfectly capable of eating. This is where they finally found out I had a very severe case of the rare disorder achalasia. This is a disorder where the muscles in your lower esophagus spasm uncontrollably making it difficult to swallow. It's also a very rare disorder that is exceptionally rare in people under 20. I was 15. Eventually after a few more weeks on a liquid diet I had a surgery to resolve the issue and I was able to eat again. However, it was a very annoying and painful process to get to that point. I'm sorry they didn't take that seriously. This entire thread is making me so infuriated. Aquagenic pruritus. It affects me every day. Some days are worse than others. I worked with a doctor for about a year on trying to find a cause. In the end he concluded with me water was the only common factor in my outbursts of extreme itching. Laughed as he left the room. That's the last time I saw him. I went home and google searched my symptoms. Saw a forum for people who had identical issues. Tried their methods and it has really helped. I've been having gallbladder attacks for months now. I mean it felt like death was knocking on my door and I was gonna. Apparently it couldn't be my gallbladder because it didn't hurt the right way and there were no stones. Guess who has a diseased gallbladder? Only found out after I absolutely insisted they do more testing. I was in pain for 10 years before they finally did an ultrasound and saw stones. They said I was too young. I had a stone the size of a chicken egg wedged in a 10mm duct and my gallbladder was dying from lack of blood flow because the stones cut off circulation. I asked 6 doctors to check my gallbladder before one finally did once I was old enough. When I was about the 3rd grade, I was adamant that I needed glasses. It was hard to see, but when I went to the doctor, for some reason they assumed I wanted glasses because all the smart girls in school had them partially true. But I could not see. Fast forward a few years and I'm 15 trying to get my learner's permit for driver's ed. They tell me I can't start driving until I see a doctor about my eyes. I go and I get seen. They tell me I have a fairly severe case of refractive amblopia. I'm blind in my left eye. To all but colors and very vague shapes. My doctor tells me if I had caught it before I was around 10, I could have participated in therapy to reverse the damage to my eyes and the optic nerves, because I hadn't, it's irreversible. No surgery, no corrective lenses, that's just my lot in life. I didn't have any trouble in school like kids with undiagnosed vision problems do. My eyes track correctly, there's no physical indicator I cannot see, so no one ever thought anything of my complaints and eventually I stopped complaining. It doesn't hurt me, but I have no depth perception, and it was disappointing to hear it can't be fixed. Interstitial cystitis. It's a painful bladder condition that is poorly researched and not well known about. How I explain it is, when it flares up, it feels like I have a bladder infection, burning, peeing lava, feeling like there's a rubber band around my bladder, all that, but I can't take antibiotics because there's no infection to clear up and the prescription medications for it are really iffy, so I just have to wait it out. Anyway, I went to the doctor for 5 years who kept telling me I don't know what's wrong with you, drink more water. Then I finally got a diagnosis from another doctor. Then it flared up really badly so I went to visit another doctor who refused to believe the diagnosis and made me do STI tests, which I had already done about 10 times, as well as a pelvic exam. Extremely painful when I'm in a flare and then told me I probably have pelvic inflammatory disease from an untreated STI. I said I've been in a relationship for 7 years, I've never had another partner, I don't have an STI and he said something about how that doesn't matter. So I spent a week internally freaking out that my so cheated on me, 
Then they called back and said my results were totally clean. Now I don't even bother going to the doctor when I have a flare up. I've had an a doctor lecture me about having PTSD for sexual assault because it's a choice to put yourself in those situations. Military are the only ones with legit PTSD according to this a doctor. He was seeing me for a severe panic attack I had. I hope you filed a complaint about him. That's horrible. When I was 14 I woke up paralyzed, was screaming my head off freaking out. Parents took me to her a few hours later when they realized I wasn't faking it. Doctors put me in mental ward, saying there's no physical reason she can't move, so she just believes she can't move. They finally do an MRI. I have epilepsy. It was a seizure type called Todd's paralysis, where you have a seizure in your sleep, and your brain and body lose connection for a period of time. Vaginismus. It's where your pelvic floor muscles contract involuntarily when you try to insert something like a tampon, a penis, vibrator, or in this case a speculum. Most genus are not understanding of it, even if you're having a panic attack on the table. Not one doctor could explain to me what was going on so I just believed, for many years that I was either mentally weak or physically fricked up. Throughout puberty I cried and screamed from the pain in my sternum. It felt as though something was pulling it back from inside and I had a stabbing pain throughout my sternum. As a kid, my sternum was normal and perfectly fine, but it caved in during puberty. Along with this, several of my ribs got all fricked up and started taking on weird curves and dents. I went to several male doctors as a kid and they all said the pain was in my head and that my ribs and sternum must have always been like this. I begged my mother to take me to a female doctor because old male doctors were horrible about telling females everything was in their head. She never did and I never found out WTF my body was doing. Now I have pectus excavatum and some fricked up shaped ribs. My doctor flat out refused to believe I could have endometriosis because I was only 19. She gave every excuse from you have gas to it's in your mind. Then my appendix was bursting a few months later and when they pulled it out it was covered in endometrial adhesions. I had to have two laparoscopic surgeries to remove all the adhesions that had begun to cover all of my insides. Lipedema. I have always been the chubby girl and then the fat girl since high school. About 4 years ago, I find out I have lupus. I go to my rheumatologist who looks at me for a few minutes and says your knees, where are your knees I think to myself, what you have not seen fat people knees before. I leave but her comment haunted me. One night last year I started googling fat people knees and the word lipedema came up. I immediately started crying. These were my people. I finally felt like I found my truth. Not lying. Lipedema is a fat disorder where your body doesn't store fat correctly. Therefore, no diet or exercise will remove the fat because the body doesn't recognize it correctly. It starts during puberty and increase during other hormonal times. Its other name is painful fat syndrome. Which explains why sometimes even a blanket on my lap hurt. This explains why 1200 calorie diets never worked. Gastric bypass didn't work. Still my it's didn't believe me, I had to sit one down with over 300 pages of documentation before he understood. Very few doctors have heard of it and even less treat it. I had to drive 2 hours to a lymphatic specialist. He looked at me and immediately diagnosed me with lipedema. Since then I have had 2 very large liposuctions to remove the diseased tissue. I will have to wear compression garments to prevent regrowth but at least I know what is wrong with me No, If you google it. It is lipedema and not lymphedema. People always get them mixed up. Thank you for this. I've always been fat, but my calves have always been abnormally huge to the point where doctors are concerned but they just poke at my legs and move on. They look just like the lipedema pics. I'm going to go see my doc about this. You may have just saved my life, so thank you. Not sure if it would be considered a medical condition, but when I get nervous really upset any kind of excited emotion really, I'll get these super red blotchy type marks on my chest. If it's extreme, they'll appear on my neck, shoulders, and even the side of my face. They're not bumpy or itchy, so I don't think they're hives. Just these really oddly shaped red splotches. I've gone to a few doctors for it, but they had no clue what caused it. Just told me to take Benadryl and live with it Benadryl doesn't help. This might be blood vessel dilation from being nervous. Pretty normal. Similar to blotches some people get from alcohol. 
This was when I was a kid. I had what my parents called growing pains. Basically my legs would ache at night to the point I was screaming in pain. Happened from about 7-10 almost every night. I know it wasn't imagined as I remember the pain to this day. My parents took me to the doctor multiple times. Small town. One doctor. And each time he sent me home with growing pains at real. But now what really freaks me off is I don't care of the term we used for it wasn't a thing. I was in agony for 3 years and he simply sent me away. It stopped happening eventually and never knew what caused it in the first place. I was always told it was from not getting enough calcium fast enough. When I was younger my parents gave me a glass of milk when it happened, which seemed to help. Being diagnosed with interstitial cystitis as a teenager, I was in incredible pain, and found no diagnoses until the third urologist, a specialist in women's urology and specifically IC, diagnosed it via cystoscopy. I think it may be improving. Last time I was at urgent care, on vacation, the physician looked at my urine results, a decent amount of protein, even more blood, but not infection, and said, this looks like I see urine. I had the same experience, DX'd in 2006 at 18. Back then no one knew what it was and accused me of lying about being sexually active. Now I tell a doc I have it, and they nod and sympathize. Thank gods I'm mostly in remission now. Mine was severe back pain. I'm 41 male, and have thrown my back out 50-60 times since I was in my early 20s. No big deal right? Just hobble around for a few days and it usually would just slip back in on its own eventually. This went on for years until about 3 years ago I threw it out and it didn't get better after a week. Then 2 weeks. Then 3 weeks. I was working. Construction. The whole time. Finally it got to the point where I just couldn't function or take the pain anymore. So I went to the doctor. Take it easy, wear a brace etc etc and sent me on my way. That lasted another week until I finally drove to the air at 3am. I told them what was up, and insisted on a MRI CT scan. Those suckers were dead set on giving me an aspirin and sending me home with a pat on the head. The dumb luck of what happened next is the only reason I believe I'm actually okay now. They were going to give me a shot of something. Can't remember what, but it wasn't a painkiller. And I told them that once in a while when I get a shot, I will get a bit queasy, lightheaded. Okay, no biggie. Well I couldn't really lay down because it just hurt to dang much. So I was sitting in the hospital room when she gave me the shot. Then she immediately left the room and I was alone. Sure enough I started getting a sick feeling. So I stood up to go get ready to puke into the trash can. And I proceeded to pass out cold and fall to the floor. Hitting my head on the tile floor so hard it broke my nose and gave me a gash that required quite a few stitches. Well I woke up surrounded by hospital staff being gurneyed to, you guessed it MRI. Because I fell in the hospital, lawsuits and all that crap. Well long story short, I had three absolutely destroyed discs. One which was shattered in pieces poking into my spinal cord. Big surgery less than a week later, and feeling great now. All because I'm a little bee that can't handle needles. Listen to that. The doctors would only give this person the MRI he needed when it was their neck on the line. Isn't that freaking typical? <laughs> Chronic migraines. I have a migraine every day, but about once a year since I was 12 I have one so bad I have to be hospitalized. The last time I went, a doctor pulled my mother into the hall and not so quietly accused me of faking it for meds. After trying 3 or 4 meds and my head consistently getting worse, he came back and told me he was giving me the strongest meds the hospital could provide me, and within 20 minutes my nose started bleeding and I was screaming from the pain. He told me he had given me a placebo the last time, and I had to be hospitalized in a quarantine room for 3 days. Quietest room they had available. No clue what's wrong with me still. I was a sickly kid. I was underweight and I'd catch whatever bug was coming around. Headaches. Body pain. Sensitivities. Bathroom issues. Test results were always just barely within the boundaries of normal, but if somebody had put all the pieces together I could have gotten help. My mom called me a hypochondriac. I remember being about 13 and crying at the doctor, asking what was wrong with me. I told him I eat healthy and exercise. Why do I feel so bad all the time? He told me to put on weight, believed my mom that I was making it all up, 
told me to eat a Twinkie. Turns out I have celiac disease. I was malnourished all my life because my body wasn't absorbing the nutrients in my food. For me it didn't show up in regular blood work. It wasn't found until I was 26 and got an endoscopy looking for ulcers. My daughter has it too. So does a cousin. There are better tests now. Thankfully. So hopefully nobody else goes through what I did. I spent over 3 years being treated and tested for chronic leg pain. Had every kind of scan available. Physical therapy. Testing for nerve disorders. Etc. They couldn't find a reason for why I was in indescribable agony all the time. Even when I didn't walk. And when I did walk. My kneecaps would dislocate. No one believed me when I said the physiotherapy was making it worse. Because it's supposed to hurt. Finally I end up sobbing in the head osteous office. Telling him I just want to die. The pain is too much. Just amputate my dang legs above the knee or I'm going to kill myself. A new doctor stopped by to see what the commotion was and after looking over my file, he had me lie on my front on the couch and drew some lines on the soles of my feet with a marker pen and a protractor. And that's how we discovered I had rotated tibias, nearly 30 degrees. It's usually only seen in people who have had breaks which haven't healed right, which I hadn't, or in a small children. Where it is fixed with a soft leg brace because the bones are still malleable. There have been only like 4 adult cases like mine in the last 5 decades at my local hospital. Basically while the ends of my tibia were still growing. The center part of my bone started to rotate. Meaning all of the attachment points for muscles. Ligaments and tendons were all being pulled sideways as the bone slowly rotated. Because it was so slow. There was no sign of inflammation or scarring so although the physiology of my leg looked a little skewed it still looked in the normal range. Obviously as I got older the blend hardened and I was then stuck with twisted tibias. So imagine someone grabbing your shin bone and twisting it 30 degrees and having everyone tell you everything is fine. The physiotherapy was actually making it worse and I ended up with some overlong ligaments and nerve damage caused by continuing the treatment while my condition wasn't known. One leg has since been fixed but it will never be normal. I essentially got my wish and had it amputated. They cut through the tibia and reattached in the correct position. Waiting for the opportunity to have my second done. So thank you Mr. Protractor Doctor. You literally saved me from a lifetime of suffering. And also, I'm really sorry for all the things I said under anesthetic. You are really handsome and I was very happy to finally be getting fixed. I have a diagnosis and my regular doctors are wonderful and supportive. But I have an inflammatory skin condition that leaves me with constant, painful, boils and abscess. Every few years, I have one that gets infected and I have to go to the ear to get it lanced. It's painfully and psychologically traumatic every time. Maybe 4 years ago, I'd had a fever for a week. This is always a sign that the infection has gotten out of control and I need IV antibiotics. I go to the ear, explain the situation to the Tridge nurse, of course my fever has finally broken as soon as I speak to her, but fine, she admits me and I wait. My name is called, I explain to the doctor, he rolls his eyes and tells me it's called the flu, but fine, let's take some blood, oh, the nurse mentioned you had something with your skin, let me see, I uncomfortably pull down my pants and show the doctor my skin, he proceeds to tell me to stop shaving. I very clearly cannot, and do not shave, because those are just ingrown hairs. I very politely tell him that no, actually, I have this skin condition called HS. Those are boils and I need a particularly bad one lanced. He proceeds to again, roll his eyes and tell me I'm wrong, belittle me, etc. I walked out, I got my IV antibiotics from my dermatologist who was horrified. Thanks for almost killing me of sepsis ignorant misogynistic doctor. Pain relievers that supposedly have really strong side effects like being knocked out almost immediately will work maybe once or twice. Then the rest of the prescription the side effects will hardly work. The pain relief does thankfully. But when I had a tooth pulled I got some pills that my mom said would frick me up and how lucky I was. I just got really tired after the first pill. The second. Not so much. Then I didn't feel much side effects anymore. When I explain my high tolerance to doctors I feel like they think I'm drug seeking. Same when lidocaine is wearing off within 30 minutes and I ask for laughing gas instead. 
Don't ever tell a healthcare provider you have a high tolerance to pain meds, even if it's true. In general we are not prescribing as freely as we once did. And those types of statements make you that ultra high risk patient that we fear will either abuse or overdose unintentionally. Right or wrong this is pretty much reality in the post addiction world. This isn't a current condition and prepare yourself for a semi long story. I was having serious back pain so I went to the ER at like midnight after getting fed up for months. They told me my gallbladder needed removal but it wasn't urgent. I could do it that week or in two weeks. I wanted it over with but I had to defend my master's thesis in two days so I said I'll just live with the pain and put it off. So I defended my thesis. My back still killing me. That weekend the pain got worse but I said I'd wait. As I was teaching on Monday morning, I was at a the pain all of a sudden got close to excruciating. By some coincidence I had a scheduled checkup that day so I called in pain and asked if I could come in early. They said sure and I rushed to the hospital. The doctor saw me. I told him my pain was a 10. I could barely drive and I felt like a 1000 knives were stabbing me from the inside. He refused to take me seriously. He told me he wouldn't admit me to the hospital since hospitals are full of germs. Instead he'd move up my surgery date to the next day. He told me go around and get stuff done for it. Drive home and come back in the morning. I stubbornly did the things they needed. Blood work, etc. I was near dying the whole time but no one would listen to me. I finished the list of tasks and couldn't take it anymore. I ran back up to the doctor's office and in tears of pain I begged the nurse to let him see me again. He saw me again but still didn't believe me. My tears of utter pain. And I was a young healthy male. Went enough for him but eventually he decided they'd see if I could be admitted. But something went wrong. I don't know where. I told the nurse I needed to be rushed to the air. The doctor then supported that decision instead. This poor older lady wheeled me down to the air because at that point I couldn't really walk. She waited with me for a half hour as they found me space on a gurney in a hallway. She was my guardian angel that day. I later sent her flowers. The nurse pumped me with morphine. It didn't do anything so he pumped me with dialaudid. That stopped most of the pain except the pain in the gallbladder itself. After 7 hours I was admitted to the hospital. I lived off that painkiller like a drug addict all night. I had my surgery as scheduled the next day. I later found out my gallbladder had ruptured and was eating at my liver. I was at risk of going septic. My doctor admitted in a haughty way that he did not know it ruptured. Anyway all is fine now and I recovered fairly quickly. It was an ordeal I would like to never repeat. I still thank that nurse for being the only person who actually listened to me. I'm glad you're better, friend. Pain is no fun, regardless of the severity, excluding kinks. I don't judge. A severe nickel allergy. It was horrific. Went on for about 8 months. Had nosebleeds I couldn't stop. Dry, cracked and itchy eyelids and underies that would turn a brownie red and occasionally bleed. Skin around my hands, arms and lower half of my face was basically melting off. Unbelievable fatigue. The thought of walking to the kitchen for something to drink made me cry haha. Had to keep working to pay for all the doctor's appointments. But whatever I was allergic to was in my workplace. I saw 5 different doctors and all they did was give me the same steroid cream to try for a few days only and if it came back again, to go back and see them. All of them were more interested in my due smear test and how amazing my asexuality was more than the fact I could barely see out of my sore cracked eyes. Every. Single. Doctor. One of them even told me she wished her daughter was asexual, and that it must be truly a great relief for my mother. It was humiliating. 8 months of pain. Sickness and sadness I finally found a doctor who admitted that he had no idea, and referred me to a specialist. I showed him 3 photos. I had to quit my job so it had more or less cleared up, and he identified it as a severe nickel allergy. Imababa. Turns out it worn through the coatings of my old shears and was rubbing the bare metal all over my hands and then touching my skin with my dang hands. Now I've got a shiny new pair of A grade shears and I'm back to normal. Sorry about those doctors making stupid butt comments about your asexuality. I had a therapist who was like but sex is part of a relationship. Then insisted I sold Verl let my ex GF basically rape me. You. What a douchebag. I'm glad you figured that one out. Holy crap. 
when I was a child my pediatrician knew and had proof of part of my medical conditions. Specifically rotoscoliosis that forms into deformed ribs crushing my left lung. It doesn't fully expand. She chose to not tell us. Eventually my mom started to really think twice because I always complained about my back hurting. She ended up making an appointment with a different pediatrician. He took x-rays. When we meet with him after the x-rays he told us that he couldn't do anything that it was out of his experience. He explained it the best he could but sent us an immediate referral to someone else. We met with the new doctor. Showed him the previous x-rays. He literally laughed at us. Said there was no way these were right because I wouldn't be alive or at the very least not walking. He was so sure we were wrong he ordered his own tests. An MRI. Once we did that, he personally called us. Not his nurse or receptionist. He called us and apologized. He was in disbelief that I had so much going on and still walking around like a normal kid. Unfortunately for me by the time it was all found out my rotoscoliosis had gone past the point of help. This happened when I was 8-9 years old. I'm now 23 years old. Who they didn't even think I would live this long. To this day it doesn't matter what I tell the doctors they don't believe how bad it is until they see it for themselves. I went to the ER recently and they did chest x-rays. I tried to tell them beforehand my medical conditions so they wouldn't freak out. They dismissed me then I'm standing there after they take the first one. I hear them saying, oh my god, did you see this? Look at her spine. The doctor in a said well yours rays look fine other than some bad scoliosis. Awkwardly laughs because he realized he should have listened to me beforehand. I have myalgic encephalomyelitis aka chronic fatigue syndrome, me CFS. It took me over 10 years to get diagnosed as most healthcare professionals did not take me seriously until about 3 years ago. There was a time in my life when I was completely paralyzed and unable to speak because I was literally too exhausted to open my eyes for days at a time. I was branded exclusively with mental health issues in my teens and overprescribed with Xanax, sleeping meds, and SSRIs into my 20s. It was a relief to find out a decade later that the constant flu symptoms were not all in my head. Go watch Unrest on Netflix to get an idea of the disease and the injustice surrounding it. I have been seeing an allergist asthma immunology doctor for bad seasonal allergies. On Christmas, I had my first asthma attack triggered by tobacco smoke. I started coughing and couldn't stop. Literally felt like I had a Brillo pad in my throat bronchial tubes. I was coughing so bad I couldn't catch my breath, and everything was closed up and inflamed. Literally an hour and a half both times. Never had this before and I grew up around smokers. Second time was residual weed smoke covered by very strong perfume. Went to the ear both times and an albuterol breathing treatment got me breathing again. My initial pulse ox was in the 70s before the treatment. My allergist did spirometry and it was normal. Several times. But when I was at the ear, the doctors there called it asthma. But he won't call it asthma because my lung volumes look good. What the frick else could it be? My primary gave me a prior inhaler. Simbacort. Flonase and hardcore allergy pills. Also, a nebulizer. Haven't had an attack since February. Knock on wood. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.